topic is data ingestion using Apache Anapod. It will be presented by Sonia Krishnan and Yu Wee. Uh, Sonia serves uh, Softworks as a senior consultant, data engineer, and eight years of experience building code infrastructure and frameworks. In the past few years, in the engineering space, in the spread line, she loves to distribute it as a puzzle. Yu Wee is a consultant in Softworks. He worked uh, extensively with data analysis, analytics, and web development space. He enjoys building cool machine learning apps using Python, JavaScript, React, and integrating with APIs. And in his spare time, he wants to run. So, start. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, you here at Somia. So um, we work for ThoughtWorks. Uh, ThoughtWorks is a software consulting firm. Um, so uh, we work for, as in we build cool software for a lot of different companies. Um, so Somi and I work in different projects and we are both data engineers in our respective projects. So I work for a ride hailing company and she's more of a um, consumer goods and products company. Yep. So we just collaborate together and decided to share our experiences using Airflow and um, the best practices of using that for data ingesting ETL pipelines. Yep. So of how our presentation will be today. Um, first, we'll explain how uh, ETL. We explain the concepts of ETL and how we're going to do uh, ETL using Airflow, and then we have a deep dive into the concepts of Airflow and the best practices based on our experiences. So um, just just a quick brief uh, of the level of experience in the audience. How many of you are working as data engineers and how many are students? So that uh, we'll know exactly what time, what's the time to spend on each. How many are working data engineers or and how many are students and new to data ingestions? Okay, that's quite a lot. <laughs> okay, so, so we'll, we'll try to spend a bit more time on the concepts level instead of like the use cases and yeah. Um, so ETL, which means extract, transform, and load it. Um, so typically what we do is uh, we want the, the, the consumers of the ETL to be a form of applications where you can display um, internal data or, or like you want to feed it into some machine learning model. So you, we want as much data as possible and the data to be as varied as possible. So sometimes you want to feed in data with let's say social media, social network like Facebook, Instagram, and then CMS data in terms of internal say your customer profile data and then application database which comes from another internal applications and like you want to have say a weather data you want to have like traffic data all this data comes into play when you want to make uh, decisions for your application for your customers which customers to target and then all this data you want to integrate them together and do some form of transformation and making sense of them uh, building um, the profile of the customers. And then you will load it to say uh, your big data, which is your HDFS, which is part of your data warehouse, and also your consumer of your ETL pipeline, which is uh, probably your Postgres, Cassandra form of database. And Airflow sits outside of this picture where it orchestrate the jobs, the pipelines of this. So you have Airflow to schedule the jobs for your ETL pipelines. So Airflow is a, is a workflow orchestrator. It helps to um, schedule and monitor your workflows using code. So over here, we, we have a sim sample DAG. So DAG meaning directed acyclic graph. That is the, one of the most important concepts of Airflow. And um, over here, you can see like there's Python operators and that is uh, equals to the variable task. I uh, will we'll go in depth into the concepts later, but um, over here you can see that uh, there's a Python operator, which means, uh, which it's called the validate data, as well as the other one is passing data. So 
in Airflow, you can write these workflows as code. So it's very readable and it allows you to easily monitor. So, yep. yep. So Mia will now describe more uh, why we chose Airflow and then the, some of the concepts of Airflow. Hi, hello everyone. Um, so uh, thanks, Yuri. So I saw a few hands on, you know, who are data engineers here. How many of you have already used Airflow before? Oh, wow. Quite a few. Anyone for Luigi, Azure Data Factory? Okay, okay. So we are gonna just share our experience of, you know, why did we choose uh, Airflow when compared to the other plethora of tools available for workload, you name it, you have Luigi, you have Uzi, Azkaban, you know, the space is teeming with a lot of options. So for the use case that we had, you know, in order to do a ETL workflow, these were some of the things that we chose as a, uh, this is a workflow tool, you obviously would want to have a workflow dependency management, right? You would want to have a branching in your workflows, you would want to skip something in your workflows, so you would want to actually cater to a lot of options in your workflows, right? If this, do that, choose another branch in your workflow. So uh, with our experience of spiking with Airflow, we found that uh, Airflow has pretty good way of uh, designing elegant workflows with a lot of options to take control of you know, what you want to do with it. And also the UI seems to be pretty good uh, when compared to the other tools that we were spiking out with. Um, and the scheduling aspect of it, uh, so you can schedule in any intervals just like you know, do it in frequent intervals, or if you want, you, if you missed a run, you can go back and run an ingestion on a specific day and so on, right? Um, ease of scalability, right? So when you're running your data, which is like in, in, in terabytes, right? You would want to run it on a cluster typically, right? And uh, with ease of uh, scalability, what we mean is if you need more compute nodes, it's very easy to plug in and play with Airflow. So you can say, just connect me to a Mesos executor, which will take care of the cluster management. I can quickly scale and run the tasks on like multiple nodes across the cluster. Right? Uh, testability is good. And security, I think it has a lot of options. I think UV would be covering in the forthcoming slides. You know, you have Google Auth and you have uh, LDAP. <laughs> LDAP and a lot of other options on the security side of things. Uh, documentation community support is good. The thing I want to stress on is the modularization aspect. As I go through the concepts, you'll see the way Airflow is designed. It kind of has like a separation of responsibilities. The part that writes your actual logic is different from the part that actually schedules your job. So it's it's cleanly separated out and, and it's pretty designed pretty well. Right? So I'm just going to do a bit of deep dive into the uh, Airflow architecture. Now, let's start with the left side of components, right? You can think of Airflow as, as a queuing service, you know, sitting on top of a, a metadata database. So typically, if you want to run a workflow, just like what you showed you, uh, you write a DAG, which is a direct acyclic graph, right? It's like a set of nodes put together, you can say, these are the tasks that need to run as part of my DAG. Okay. When you say this is my workflow, the scheduler is the component that goes and sees, okay, this is a new DAG that has come in and looks at the metadata database. The metadata database is nothing but it's going to store the state of each task in the DAG. Right. So it's going to say, okay, is this task eligible for running? Are there any dependencies missing for this task? Right. So if it finds that a task can, can be run, it it, it sends it over to the executor, right? The executor is the one that will say, okay, this is the task that's eligible for running. Which node do I run it on? So there are a lot of worker nodes. You decide which worker node you want to run on. Is everyone familiar with worker node? Uh, like if you run it in a cluster or something, it's a node where, which performs the actual computation, right? Um, so once the task is finished, we say, okay, this task is done go and populate back in the metadata database, this task is done. And the scheduler again thinks, what's the next task to run? So this goes on in a loop. That's the part which controls the scheduling in, in, in an app loop, right? The right-hand side, if you look at uh, the web server and the web UI uh, are for like the dashboard aspect, where you know from the dashboard you can control, this is the DAG I want to trigger, and uh, okay, so in my workflow I can monitor the 
status of the workflow, and so on. And you can write your logs on to your local disk or, or your uh, remote. You can write it to cloud storage, and you can, you can just hook it on as part of Airflow. So this is on a very high level on how Airflow works. So you can think of it as a system that will schedule your tasks and help you monitor the same. Right? Um, now going on with the concepts uh, in Airflow, all right, let's start at the bottom. Right? An operator is a class that, that, uh, that has the logic to run a task, validation or parsing. In your typical, typical ETL workflow, your operator is the class that says, this is what gets done in validation. Right? That's like the logic. Uh, there are kind of like three different operators that Airflow offers. One is, you know, th there are a lot of out-of-box operators. There are like Spark operators, there are Hive operators, there are Druid operators, a lot of out-of-the-box operators that Airflow, Airflow provides. So if you want to run a Spark job, just grab the Spark operator and just run your job with that. And uh, uh, you can write your custom operators. There's something called sensor, right? People who have written the ATL pipeline, you know that I want to run these jobs only when the source file arrives, right? You want to trigger something only on an event that's happening. So a sensor uh, facilitates the same. So you can keep, sensor helps you pull for something to happen. So you can say only when the source file arrives, do the rest of the jobs. That's a sensor, right? And the transfer operator, uh, you would want to transfer data from one system to another. So Airflow also provides uh, features to you know transfer from data transfer operators between two different systems, right? Um, these are operators, okay? Think of them as classes. And what are tasks? Tasks are nothing but instantiated operators. You can think of them as objects, right? With the parameters, if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see a task is nothing but when you associate uh, all the relevant documents to it, parameterize it, and attach it to the DAG, which is the workflow. It becomes a task. And then the task instance, so, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, the scheduler keeps polling for, you know, which task can I run, right? When it gets picked up by the scheduler, it becomes a task instance, right? Th these are like the core concepts in, in Airflow. Um, some of the other concepts uh, that you will, once you start with it, you will hit something called XCOM, right? XCOM is nothing but a cross-communication uh, feature in Airflow. So, the tasks are running on different nodes, and if you would want to communicate, you would want a, a feature where you can store your shared state and then pass it on between the tasks. That, that, that's XCOM, right? Um, and there are hooks. Um, hooks are nothing but you will be connecting to multiple other databases or you know uh, the Hadoop uh, storage. Hooks are uh, interfaces to these external systems. And this comes out of the box from Airflow, so which would mean that you want to write your data emission job and persist into uh, HDFS or persist into somewhere else. You just look for the hook in the Airflow suit and then use it to write your own operators. Right. So these are pretty much the concepts in Airflow. So I'll pass on back to Yuvi to talk about the features. Um, okay, talking about the features of Airflow. Um, like what Somia mentioned, there's a lot of uh, hooks uh, which allows you to integrate with multiple clouds and multiple databases. Then obviously it has very good cloud integration. Um, the big players, AWS, GCP, and Azure. And in terms of scalability, <coughs> then you have Salary, which is a distributed um, worker node. It's, it's, Salary is a framework that you can use for multiple other Python uh, frameworks. And Dust is, is something it's for parallel distributed computing for, especially for data analytics uh, pipelines. And Mesos is, uh, it has been quite popular within Spark and it's a form of distributed uh, computing as well. So security, so Airflow has um, features as has the ability for you to integrate to your company's LDAP, Kerberos if you're using HDFS and Google Auth. And data pro profiling is, is a fancy term to say that uh, to allow you to actually query the data from the Airflow UI. And for backfill, what it means is that, say, uh, you schedule, you want to run your Airflow deck, say, on a Monday, and today is on a Saturday. So you have missed the day that from Monday to Friday. So Airflow actually allows you to run from Monday to Friday again, even though you started that deck on Saturday. So it runs on historic data. 
and monitoring aspects like you want to know whether the deck actually ran successfully, failed or not. And the UI actually allows you to monitor that rather easily. It allows you to monitor in the task level and at the deck level. And then you also have like Slack alerts and you know? also email alerts as well. Um, so now I'll just uh, give a quick demo of the UI. So this is how the Airflow UI looks like. And the, the decks that you can see here are the decks that you registered with the Airflow scheduler. And this cron, this, this schedule is basically in the cron syntax. And the uh, recent task is like, um, the green one is like, is successful, uh, whether it passed or failed. So here you will see, um, I think the difference of course means the different um, status. And this is the last one, and then here the different links allows you to actually um, run the deck, uh, see the gun chart, see the tree, see the graph. So this is actually the graph view of it. Um, so if you click on, if you were to click on this, then it will bring you to this uh, this page. So this is more of a deck level, and you can have a graph view, tree view, and um, multiple views of it. Yeah. So this is actually a Python operator, so print the context. It's actually a Python task, and then I think it bro brings you to uh, the multiple other next tasks. So this is just an example that we return and it's just sleep for zero seconds, sleep for one second. It doesn't make any sense at all, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think that's important. Okay, um, talking about best practices. So building ETL is part of building software as well. Again, um, we also want to actually um, encourage to, well, we should be writing tests around the ETL pipelines and um, when we're writing software. So when, if, if you were to need to, if you were need to do any customization of the uh, airflow operators and Airflow doesn't provide this um, operator that allows you to achieve what you want. Then you have to actually write your customized operators for it. Then operators are basically just Python code. So you want to write them in, write the test first and then you write the functionality of the operators. Then Airflow actually has the uh, feature to do very good unit testing of that particular task of that particular operator. So you can see here the Airflow test, the deck name, and then the task name. So this is the task that you want to run, and then the date that you want to start it at. And this one will just run that particular task in the deck. But one thing that we found is that integration in, with Airflow is not so integration testing airflow is not so um, good, as in it, it doesn't provide that support. So in order to work around that, then you actually have to trigger the entire deck with the entire task. Um, so this is how, this is actually the airflow CLI. So you can then type like airflow trigger deck and then the deck name and then the date. Yeah. Um, with Continuous integration, uh, we recommend to have the valid, to validate the DAG syntax and functionality within your CI pipeline for Airflow. So Airflow, if you were to register the DAG, if the DAG syntax is incorrect, it will, not, it will not actually be part of your UI. So it will just, it will complain, um, it will complain when you try to register that DAG because it couldn't understand what that DAG means. And with, to, with testing your functionality, then um, part of your CI, you can then trigger uh, a DAG to, to validate the results. So build and version DAGs is more of the source control. Like you, ideally, like if this DAG doesn't work, then you want to move back to the DAG that you returned that was successful. And frequent deployments uh, move fast, yeah. All right. So uh, I'll just continue on some of the best practices that uh, you know the data engineers would have found very useful when you're writing an ETL uh, ETL 
uh, a data pipeline typically, right? So uh, during our journey of uh, building this pipeline with Airflow, the thing that we saw is it kind of emphasizes a lot on uh, the functional way of uh, writing pipelines. So the main aspect is item potency of tasks. Um, I, item potency is typically you run the task how many ever times, right? It should give you the same same result, right? It, like if you run it the first time and you run it the second time, your validation shouldn't be giving you two different results on the same data, right? Shouldn't typically have side effects, right? So if you start out building your data pipeline, uh, uh, then these are some of the things that you should keep in mind. Keep your task pure tasks, right? And incrementally load data. You know there are some use cases where. Uh, the client keeps giving you a uh, year's worth of data in like, you know, I give you a data today for the last two years and after two months I'm giving you uh, the last three years of data, you know. Um, if, if that's the case, I think it's, it's maybe it's good to push back and say, you know, let's incrementally load data just like you do incremental commits, which will make sure that your, your source code is always sync with what you want to push, be pushed in. So in the same way, let's incrementally load data in frequent intervals so that you know your source and target are always, you know, you're using the data which is valid in nature, right? And uh, resting data between tasks, uh, I think uh, while you're doing a workflow, uh, it, it's, it's like you just store the interim results to persist your interim results. So, you're, so say you are running your analytics model and, as part of the pipeline, and you have a, uh, you have like run it for more than like few hours, right? And then uh, you have can always go down, right? And uh, uh, the interim results between tasks are always persisted. So rest your tasks between the tasks. Rest your data between the tasks. Um, immutable staging area. Um, I'm not too sure if uh, you know people. Again, the one you, if you have a pipeline and you have a target data store, and then uh, there there are times when you can have partially correct data going into the target data store, right? So in order to avoid that, always make sure you have a staging area before your target, which would mean that anything if it fails, it will fail in your staging area, and your target is always you know accurate, right? Um, Emphasis on data validation. I think we can't emphasize enough how it's important to have valid data coming in, be it for your data science or be it for your reporting in your companies. You know, when the data is coming in, uh, it isn't just enough that you just ingest it as it is. Make sure that you have uh, very comprehensive data quality checks, right? And uh, make sure that everything in your data is validated before you take it till the target, right? Um, and uh, the last point, which is uh, really key, separate your data loads from the actual deployment. So the one which UV mentioned is, is the continuous deployment of your pipeline itself, but it shouldn't get tied with your data loads. So you have your pipeline which will build the workflow uh, for you, and, and for when you're doing the data loads, use the, the production version, the QA signed off version of, of the pipeline for all your data loads, right? Um, okay. Think about the final data set. I mean, like how you say, think about the end product. What exactly is the data set that you would want at the end? And work your way backwards to find out how am I going to massage my source files? What do you need to do with the source files to actually get to the point when this is the final data set I want, and this is the, the these are the tasks I want to do in the pipeline. Right. Okay. So uh, some of the key takeaways. Uh, um, during our process, uh, the last few months of working with Airflow, it's a great tool that we would recommend for uh, building elegant work. Um, any complicated workflow can be built with Airflow and pretty quickly. And given that it's versioned and it's a code, you know, it's maintainable, and you can always use use a version. Uh, go back to a version and start using a workflow, and uh, just like you know, you start using a different version of the code. And it advocates, as I mentioned, like clean and functional way of building your workflow, separation of responsibilities, and you know it helps you test each of your tasks individually and so on. And there are a whole lot of out of out of the box plugins. Uh, so if you want to connect to Google Cloud Platform or S3 or Azure, you know you have uh, the uh, plugins already there as part of the Airflow uh, toolset. Okay, uh, 
I think, to be honest, we need to cover the ones that are not so good as well. Um, so some of the things that Airflow has to improve, we would think, is the integration testing part of it. Um, so we don't have a clear way of doing our integration tests with Airflow. And uh, the UI doesn't support auto-refresh in the sense that I want to see what, what's the status of my workflow. I need to keep clicking on the refresh button to understand the status, which is, which is something that they need to improve upon. And IE support, uh, uh, people who are IE fans, I think just, just watch out. And I think you need to do a few more things before you start using Airflow on IE. And uh, support for access control list. So if you want like role-based uh, triggering, like you know I'm a developer, you are a data scientist, only this person can trigger this workflow and not the other. And you don't have role-based uh, access uh, built in yet in Airflow. So these are the things that we would probably recommend for things to improve on the Airflow side. Right. Um, that's all, and these are the resources um, which you might find useful if you're starting out with Airflow or in general if you want to starting out with the data pipeline. So feel free to check out these resources. These are very useful. Right, thank you. We have around 10 minutes for questions. Just raise your hand, I will come to the mic. Come on, question. You, you sort of describe an architecture where uh, airflow is sort of uh, orchestrated. Uh, orchestrating um, uh, orchestrating sparklines. So is it, is it the case that I'm a data engineer and I'm, I'm supporting three or four um, uh, machine learning uh, researchers, and each of them has uh, setting up a airflow workflow that, as new data sets come in from my researchers, I set up a Spark run uh, for each of them, uh, set up a Spark model training run for each of those researchers. Is that sort of how Airflow is sort of responsible for or, uh, setting up and focus? Kicking off spark runs, is that how those two work together? Or I'm just sort of trying to imagine how that works. And then secondly, if you could describe what you mean by um, uh, if you provide a little more context around difficulties with integration tests. I wasn't quite sure what the example of that would look like. Mm. Okay. Sure. So, uh, I can take this one. Uh, so for the first one, if I understood you correctly, it's more about how exactly uh, if you want to run Spark jobs and uh, how exactly the orchestration happens and how do we write the, need to write the workflows? Right, how does Airflow and Spark work together? Okay, sure. So um, Airflow by itself is not a data streaming uh, framework, so that's something that we need to quote on. So what it would do is if you want to run a Spark job and then again uh, using the result of the Spark job you want to run yet another uh, Python task, or then you move on to MapReduce, what it's going to do is you can write a task which is a Spark operator, write your functionality as part of it. And then it, what it makes sure is that you, it kind of calls your uh, tasks in a sequence in a way that you can, you, you can reach your uh, final data set. So you have a Spark job. Using the output of that Spark job, you want to do something else. So you tie them in as uh, different tasks. Uh, it would it would make sure that it uh, uh, schedules these workflows and you know triggers them as you want. So that's something that you can do with uh, Airflow. I can elaborate yes. on that further. So uh, in terms of your use case, so you are saying that the data comes into somewhere and then um, you will run and spark job around that new fresh data that comes in and then it brings to the end results. So Airflow actually. Uh, allows you to write that whole pipeline, so you can actually have a sensor that listens to us, uh, that listens to let's say a cloud storage. When there's new fresh files coming in, it will then trigger that Spark operator. So Airflow has like data proc operator, which runs Spark jobs in Google Data Proc, or you, I think it also has uh, the native Spark operator itself. Yeah. Then it runs after it runs that then. Your, your Spark job can then write to the uh, cloud storage or whatever that your data scientist or data analyst uh, can read your files from. So that is how Airflow works. Airflow helps to orchestrate the entire pipeline. But it doesn't, Airflow doesn't move the data. Your job, your operator moves the data. Yeah. 
but also i think uh, to highlight the ecosystem maybe if you want to scale your so you can do it on connect to data pro can do it on use the computation on gcp or any other uh, cloud platform or as as we sh uh, saw we can have like the mesos or celery executor that can take care of scaling your tasks so the thing you might have to do is to write the logic and say i would want to scale it up with this particular executor where that will take care of running it on multiple nodes so you don't really need to care about setting up the cluster so it's just the ecosystem that it provides and you can you can use them up for writing your pipeline okay to your second question i don't know if i uh, he asked about what we elaborate more on the integration testing on airflow oh okay why is it bad yeah so do you want to go Okay. So uh, as far as our experience goes, uh, the integration test uh, with Airflow can be done only by triggering the uh, workflow using the command line interface, then asserting the each of the steps are run or the target data set matches with what we expect on our own. So it's like uh, there is no facility available where you know you can just use it and then write in your test as it is and it can run the DAG for me you need to build it from scratch. Mm -hmm. So trigger the DAG and do all the steps manually on our own. Mm -hmm. Like write it on our own. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But the oh. work around it is to just trigger that DAG but using a small data set so that the test is fast. Yeah. yeah. I, I just wanted to ask the difference between Apache Airflow and Apache Bing. Mm. Beam seems to be handling batch chain streaming uh, data flows and uh, so that sort of batch might be useful for your training and, and the streaming is, is what you're predicting on. And does that, how does Airflow fit into that uh, FA system? Um, I, sure. I think Beam, it's, you, Beam and Airflow, they are products for different use cases. So Airflow, Airflow was very clear on saying that they should not, they they uh, are not a data streaming solution. So Airflow actually, you can in use Airflow with Beam. And Beam is more compared to like Kafka or Spark streaming that does the uh, transforming, transformation and, and uh, passing data from one, uh, one storage to another storage. But Airflow sits outside of it. So Airflow actually helps to orchestrate the entire thing rather than, so you cannot compare Beam with uh, Airflow because there are four different use cases. Yeah. The problems that they solve are different things. You can use Airflow with Beam, Airflow with Spark Streaming, Airflow with Kafka, yeah. I, I think the things that you might want to compare Airflow with would be uh, Luigi sitting in the Python stack and uh, Uzi or Azkaban, which are also workflow uh, frameworks coming in from Apache. Right. If that's all, then uh, a round of applause and let's go on. I, I, I didn't show that the, the demo the UI, because I, <laughs> I scared I that it might be sensitive stuff. <laughs> I asked you. Yeah.